Okay. Hi, my name is Annie Barrow, and I'm the manager of horticulture outreach programs at Denver Botanic Gardens. And I'm really pleased to present to you today on horticulture practices for the Western landscape. Uh, basically, um, the horticulture outreach program, uh, my job is to educate and promote and assist in the achievement of waterwise landscapes by consulting on planting design, um, installation methods, such as soil science, uh, maintenance and irrigation practices for public and private sector. So for example, um, we are a regional program. Um, and so one of the projects we've done, um, we did an installation for uh, Lakewood and we did a Colfax median about a mile long and in installed it in June of 2019. And here you can see the before picture. And then this is us out there um, putting the plants in. And I just want to no mention that this plant here you see in red, um, that's how small we put the plants in. And that was really a, an important part of the success of this planting. Um, installing smaller plants actually results in quicker growth and quicker establishment. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of those details, but I just wanted to give you an example of a project that we did. So again, this was installed last June. And this year, this is what it looks like. And we really saw a huge amount of growth uh, and we have had no irrigation on whatsoever this whole season. So I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. A um, Couple other shots of the, of the median. And you can drive out here, it's a Colfax and Kipling, you just drive west for about a mile and you can see this in person. Um, there's another project I did with Greenwood Village and we just installed that this year. So you can see this was actually a three mile median, uh, but same idea. We approached the project with the same methodology and I think we're gonna see some great results next year. This is how it's looking so far. So one of the reasons that I have the job that I have is because there's a lot of confusion or misunderstanding about Xeriscape and what we can and cannot do with that. And I think that a lot of folks really approach Xeriscape in their mind even as, oh, this just needs to be rocky. It needs to just be simple and there's not gonna be a lot of plants, but I'm here to tell you that's absolutely not necessary. We can have a Xeriscape that's absolutely beautiful and wonderful looking, colorful, textured, all that good stuff. Now, I will admit to you the picture on the left is of the Rosewater Smart Garden at Denver Botanic Gardens. And that means that we do have a gardener that's dedicated to this garden. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful, but it really doesn't take a lot of water. Um, and the picture on the right is an example of a public space where it's a public garden in Lakewood, Kendrick Lake, and it has been established for 10 odd years. But this garden receives no irrigation, no supplemental irrigation. There's irrigation installed if we should have a drought, but um, this is just it in its natural state and there's so much color and interest going on and we can we can do that. So um, the, the reason that uh, a lot of people may not be approaching things uh, in this way is they might be thinking of Denver and Colorado as sort of the tourist um, mindset, which is a mountainous region and we've got skiing and snowing and aspens and um, you know, when I was new to Colorado, this is sort of how I thought of Colorado until I got to the Front Range and learned differently that there's actually, you know, multiple ecologies when you're in a mountain system. So where we're really at when we're on the Front Range is the High Plains. And if this was interactive, I miss it because I like to quiz people and ask them, how many inches a year do you, uh, of precipitation a year do you think we get? So you can type in answers if you want. I'm just gonna show you. Um, we get on average about 14 or 15 inches of precipitation a year. And now that means not just rain, but snow. So during the time when plants are dormant, maybe half of that is gonna be in the form of snow where our perennials aren't even growing. So we really don't get a lot of rain. And when you compare that to the Midwest or the East Coast, you can see that Chicago and New York are somewhere between 40 and 50 inches of precipitation. And that's a huge difference. So while we actually share the same zone as Chicago, we're not at all the same zone. So when you think about 
uh, Western Zone 5, we have to factor in a couple things, right? So not only we talked about the precipitation, but we also have a high likelihood of drought. And that could be at any year. In fact, it's pretty much inevitable that we're going to have a drought. Um, but furthermore, we also deal with very low humidity. Um, we're typically at 20% humidity during the day. We're higher up in the mountains, so we get a higher level of UV, which is really intense on those plants. And then we have extreme temperatures that, um, well, we might have a winter that's 30, 40 degrees, and we'll have a couple days where it's 60 degrees, and some of these plants will go back into their, you know, out of dormancy and growing again. So it can be really stressful for a plant to, to be in that situation. Of course, our soils are entirely different from the Midwest and the East Coast. Um, they're very thin and lean and sandy, not a lot of organic material. We are susceptible to a lot of heavy wet snows, which can cause a lot of breakage um, on our trees and shrubs. Um, and then of course, hail, which almost every spring, if you're planting tomatoes, you know you gotta run out there, put your burlap over your tomatoes because God forbid they get ripped up by the hail. So all of these things are happening. It's very stressful um, for our plants out here as compared to the Midwest or East Coast environment where it's a zone five, we have the same low temperature, but it's much more humid, um, 30, 40% humidity regularly. They get twice, more than twice the amount of precipitation we get. There's a lot more cloudy days. I mean, one of the great parts about being in Colorado is it's so sunny, but um, that's not always the best thing for plants um, because they're really losing a lot of water on those sunny days. There are extreme temperatures in the Midwest and East Coast, but typically, certainly before global weirding, uh, it would stay really cold throughout the winter. It really did not fluctuate. It was almost always just freezing. Um, and then the other piece that's really critical here is the soils are totally different. It, it's a forest and landscape. So there's leaf litter and debris and there's organic material always being added to the soil, um, just in the natural sense of that's the ecology of the way it is. So, so huge differences. Um, and, and so I think the lesson here is that we've really got to approach zone fives differently depending on where we are. And I think we, we just, talked about the soils here and that's what I want to get into next which is how important soils are and how different we have to approach horticultural practices here in the west. So I'm going to show you an example of oops, of, a, of our Colfax installation. This was in June of 2019 and this is how we approach the soil. Now typically we hear in horticultural methods that we want to add organic material compost, hardwood mulch, create organic matter, and, and that's the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do, unless you're doing a zero escape, unless you're planting plants that like drought, that are native plants. So we took out existing soil of, the, uh, of this median about 16 inches down and mixed it to a 50-50 rate of squeegee and topsoil. Um, you can also use uh, backfill or however you want to do it, but essentially what you're doing is you're not adding organic material, you're adding drainage. And why is this important? So squeegee is what I like to use. Now squeegee is um, uh, basically quarter inch rock or smaller aggregate. And the reason that it works so well and it works better than hardwood mulch and organic matter is it allows the water to penetrate the soil. And that means that the water goes down to the roots of the plant rather than being held at the top. So not only does that allow the roots to get access to this water, but it also stops the water from being held by that mulch and evaporated because the mulch is a dark brown, the sun hits it and it's gonna evaporate away. So it gets that water down to the roots and then it also just stops the, the crown from rotting, especially during winter time where there's snow on the ground, you know, holding that water against the, the crown of the plant, especially a xeric plant, it's going to cause that plant to rot out. And, and also it helps with heat. So reflecting the heat, if we use mulch to be squeegee, which is usually a light tan color, that's also gonna reduce that heat island effect when you're planting in a median or in other places, just 
a little bit less, I mean, they're already, the plants are already dealing with UV and, and extreme temperatures and all that we talked about before. So the, the less stress we can produce for these plants in their environment, the better. So um, again, this is just an um, example of, I'm sure you're mostly all familiar with squeegee, but I do recommend that our success has been adding um, it, squeegee and existing soil or topsoil at a 50-50 or one-to-one -one ratio. Um, at a minimum, I like to add 30% squeegee to existing soil and use that as mulch as well. So squeegee would be the mulch. Organic matter, compost, hardwood mulch, it's just not necessary. And what's great about this is it actually reduced your cost because when you put squeegee down, it's not gonna break down into organic matter and you're not gonna have to replace it each year like you typically would. Um, so that's, that's a cost savings in the long run and it's better for the plant. So, you know, the reason this, this really occurs um, and works in our natural landscape is in our in our man-made landscape rather is because this is what we see in, in nature. If you go for a walk, here's a penstemon here on the left in a natural setting. You can see how rocky that soil is. All we're doing is it's easier to go with nature than fight nature. It's a lot more costly to add a ton of compost and mulch and work a huge space and fix up that soil again and again. You know, if we just do what's already happening and use the plants that are appropriate, it's easier for everybody and the plants are gonna be happier. So here's a penstemon, this is coral baby and a garden setting and you can see, you know, it's got the mulch, it's the rock mulch and the squeegee around it and it's happy as can be. So let's not fight nature, follow the cue and really think about, I know it goes against the grain, but the soil is so critical. Now, the second thing that occurs to me to be really important is um, is that as a designer, as landscape architects, as the expert on a project, I really think it's our job to educate our clients and promote these water-wise designs. We are the experts, and while our clients might want X, Y, and Z, we can find alternative ways, and we don't have to resort to Midwestern methodologies or Midwestern plants in order to deliver the solutions and the, the aesthetics that they're looking for. So, you know, if we can talk to our clients about, you know, how we can do a water-wise garden and still offer it to be lush and beautiful and encourage and ensure that it is gonna be not just cactus, not just rock, um, I think that's really important um, for our jobs to, to do that. And I think it's our charge. And I think it's also, you know, important to encourage people to adopt that Western landscape. So some people may want more of a traditional look and we can do that and still be xeriscaping. But we could also use cool plants like yucca or agave and very Western plants that other parts of the country can't use. And I think that's really something we can leverage as a positive. So we should think about how we can frame things for our clients to see them as a water wise and xeriscape as a good thing. For example, um, I did some work for an HOA, a newly developed HOA, where I was asked to put together a planting design for a residence. And one residence, I went ahead and put together a plant pillow that made sense for a very Western aesthetic. So there were things like yucca and belugia and sort of native plants. So you would get a sense of, of where you were in the region, in the world. And the other landscape was just as equally as xeric, but it used more traditional plants. And so that is a solution that we can use when, especially when we're dealing with residential clients that might have very particular um, things they wanna see in their garden. So I wanna talk about a couple of plants that might be really good for the traditional garden, something you might see in England or you know, people want an English country garden. There's great plants that we can use, things like lavender, Everybody knows that plant. It's a great plant for out here. Peony, much more tolerant than drought than you would expect. Um, viburnum is a classic plant here. I'm showing you the mini man viburnum. Plant Select has two really excellent viburnums. One is about three by five and the other one's eight by 10, the elegany viburnum. And they're both, you know, a viburnum to me should be in a garden because it's got that 
uh, year round interest. It's got spring flower, it's got berry, it's got fall color, and then you have something up in the winter. Daisies are a win. That's always a classic garden flower. Engelman daisy, Dalmatian daisy, all sorts of great daisies to use. Lamb's ear, which yes, can be aggressive, but in the right solution, you can use it. And that actually, that genus is really useful. And there's other um, stackies that are really beautiful to use. Dianthus or carnation, it's a very common plant that anyone would know of, but it's really drought tolerant. So just some ideas to think about, you know, how, how can we incorporate plants that are traditional, but also water wise. The other thing that I encountered when I was working with the HOA was that um, there was a proposal to use AstroTurf. And I, I understand the thinking behind that, but I have to say that I think that there's some, some drawbacks to that. And I would recommend instead using something like dog tuff. Um, dog tuff is an awesome grass. It is a warm season grass. This is the confusing part, part for most people, but that just means that it's going to be beautifully green from May until October. It's going to be super water wise. All it needs is full sun. Uh, it can take traffic. Certainly, most people have dogs here. This is the other part where I like to ask people to raise their hand. Do you have a dog? Who has a dog here? What kind of dog? I, I, see, I have a cat, but you know, if you have a Jack Russell or maybe mm -hmm. a little pug or <laughs> whatever dog you have, they're not going to mess up the lawn there's going to be no spots. And you know, you have a dog and a Subaru probably, I don't know. But this is an awesome grass and it's better than AstroTurf because AstroTurf is going to kill all that life underneath in the soil and you, your dog's going to use it and you're going to need to wash the AstroTurf. And eventually you're going to need to recycle all of that plastic. So here's a, a great example of where we really can see where dog tough would be an awesome install here. This is an urban space where people are walking their dogs along the right of way. And what you have is the result of people using the right of way for their dogs. If there's, this were to be dog tough, you wouldn't see that it would be completely green and the dogs would be happy and the people that live there would be happy. So if you haven't learned about that, there's a great video on Plant Select with, um, with Kelly talking about how he came up with that and uh, um, how his experiences with it, I urge you to visit their website to learn more. The other piece of um, planting in zero scapes is that while we can use traditional plants, we also, there's all sorts of other plants that maybe aren't as popular and aren't as in your face in the um, industry. So we have to develop a palette for our region. And I don't think we have that quite yet. Um, we, I think working with local growers um, to learn about what they're growing, to explore their plants and what they have available. And even when you're doing a big job, if you work with a local grower, you can plan your order for the next year and they can work on propagating in mass or to, to you know, suit your project's needs. And then of course, we're all here, um, of course, uh, Plant Select is certainly a way to go. Uh, all those plants are available in gardens um, all throughout the West. And you can um, visit the website and really just click on that plant and find out where you can get it. So if you're not using Plant Select plants, you definitely should be. Here's just a couple plants I just put on here to show you. I don't know how many people are familiar with Baptisia. This is one of the plants that we put in the Colfax median and it looks amazing. Um, and it's a really beautiful plant. You wouldn't think it was, it was xeric. It doesn't look like a cactus plant or a Western plant. And here's um, a plant most people use, Leatrus cobold, Leatrus spicata. But there's alternatives if you look at the species. Leatrus punctata might be a little bit harder to find, but it's worth having because it's going to survive and thrive in drought. So um, back to plant select, I want to just talk about how helpful this book has been to me. It has been my Bible, my dir. When I first started at the gardens a couple of years back, I used this book to really learn plants and um, have it as a reference at my table as I was designing. It's available on Amazon. This one only has the 135 plants. Um, there's 150 plus right now and there are new plants every year. 
So use the website if you don't want to get the book, but definitely it's just a great way to start thinking about how to, to use Xerix plants. Um, there's a lot of plants that we see uh, that are often used and have been used for a long time, maybe overused. Stella de Oro, for example, or Rudbeckia. These are two plants that actually really prefer moist soils. They're great because they are very colorful and flowering and, and that's, I get why they're used and they're also very available. But I wanna just educate you on some alternatives. So really great plant is the Rudbeckia Denver Daisy. This is, a, this is an annual that reseeds. So this plant is a plant select plant. You can see it looks just like the Rudbeckia there, but actually it's a bigger flower and it's going to, again, reseed. So good option to substitute for Goldstrom. Engelman's daisy, amazing, amazing industrial strength plant that you can put in. It's about 24 inches and it blooms May through October. So it's constant bloom and it doesn't take a lot of water. Great alternative, very available in the industry. Um, Denver gold columbine. This could be used um, again and again. Um, it, could, it takes full sun and part shade. Um, it will self sow and it's our state flower. So uh, it's obviously native to our region and it will do excellent. So another nice yellow flower for the garden. Chocolate flower is one of my favorites. It's very tough, it is a native. It does smell like chocolate, but it also blooms May through October. These are my favorite plants, plants that bloom from May to October. That's the kind of plant that I want in my garden. So um, just think about when you're going for your normal plants, there's some alternatives we can use that I think might be better suited for our, our climate. Uh, another grass that I see is the Carl Forster. A lot of folks are using that grass and while it survives here, there's some great native alternatives that are equally available in the industry that we can use. The Blonde Ambition, super awesome plant. I don't have the t-shirt yet, but hopefully Ross will give me one. Um, but really cool native, um, cultivated version of that. And then the uh, standing ovation, which I think has a beautiful fall color. Both of these do great in a media and they'll do great in a home landscape. And of course, grasses are really great to use in your landscape because we live on the high plains and that's, that's what grows here. So they're gonna do super well for you. Another plant um, I think is really underused that's a beautiful shrub is the Utah service berry. Um, I know a lot of folks spec the autumn brilliance Amelanker, and that is a tree, and this is not a replacement for that if you want a, a true tree. But this is a beautiful shrub that might be in place of maybe a physocarpus or um, something that's four to five foot tall. It's got uh, four season interest, so it's got the flower, the berry in the summer, the fall color, and then a really nice um, form. And of course, if it has Utah ensis in the name, we know that it's tough as nails, right? So a great plant for, for medians and, and commercial projects. Um, a couple other plants, uh, I see people use crimson pygmy a lot in, in the landscape. And um, again, it's just, it's very common and I, I understand it's out there and available, but these are some great um, options. Recently, Mahonia has been converted to Berberis. So it's a technically a Barberry now. So it really is kind of a sub. This is a native plant, the Barbaris repens, creeping barberry. Um, this is a nice fall color. I see a lot of people starting to use this, which is great to see. Uh, it's a little prickly, so it can deter people from walking through the gardens. And then this is a larger form of the Barbaris brumanti. So this is pretty, pretty big. It's like eight to 10 foot, but um, you know, really nice yellow uh, flower that comes on, sturdy as could be and a great plant I'm not seeing a lot in the landscape that could be used. Um, Spirea is another one of those plants that I see used often and, and it just doesn't fare well. Um, it can survive, but it does not thrive. And right now there are um, two, so Amorpha is a lead plant. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you've got to try it. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, bulletproof, it's lead, lead plant, right? So super tough, has this beautiful purple blooms that come on, kind of feathery. And the Nana, which is a new plant for 2020, is a smaller version. So it's closer to some of the Spirea japonica that you might be specking right now. So a good alternative.
So one of the things that I've been doing um, since I work on medians a lot, um, and that is a contained space that's surrounded by cement on all sides, roads and sidewalks and so on. I found that using plants that self-sow can be really helpful to solve for attrition. And I think that also when we plant in informal um, designs and less formal and rectilinear design, we can get away with self-sowing. Um, it really lends a sort of naturalized look to the landscape. And again, a lot of these plants actually want, will do better if they self-sow. For example, penstemons, they really, they're a perennial, but they're not very long lived. They might live three to five years, and then they'll want to reseed. And if you allow that space and you're using the right soil amendment, which would be the squeegee or the rocky or sandier soil, they'll reseed and perpetuate themselves throughout the landscape. So here I've just listed um, moon carrot, which is one of my favorite plants in Plant Select. Really beautiful blue foliage and a pink um, to white bloom. Very unique. Got the columbine we talked about before. This is Denver Gold that'll rebloom and reseed. This one I used um, on the right, it's Nacella Mexican Feathergrass. And this is a great plant for a median. And it's very soft, a very nice texture. Uh, and anytime you're gardening with things that are gonna self sow, you can always pull out the seedlings in the spring if you feel like there's too many coming in, especially if this is a home garden. A lot of home gardeners would have time to do that. But really when you're dealing with a tough environment, you want things to self sow because things are going to event, you know, there's going to be death in the garden, right? It's life and death. So these things will fill into those spots. This is California poppy. Some hate it, some love it. I love it. It'll self seed, it's an annual. This is a native plant, retibita, and then we've got a uh, penstemon here. So None of these are aggressive or invasive, and you do want to make sure that if you're doing something that self sows, it's not going to be an invasive plant. Um, so you'd want to just double check, but none of these are like that. So, And by the way, this is impossible in the Midwest. I, I grew up in Indiana, went to Purdue. We couldn't self sow something. You couldn't barely put anything in seed in the ground and get it to grow. You'd always have to start it inside and bring it out. So this is an advantage that we can leverage out here in the West. That's unique to us. So, okay. Now, I know some folks are going to talk about trees, so I don't want to talk too much about this, but I do want to mention that we, um, Al Rollinger and Paniotti Kalaitis, did a 50 year tree study um, report on all of the trees in the Denver area over the 50 years that have survived and that have not survived. And I think this is an absolutely telling report. I put a link here so you can go and see the full report if you'd like. But I just wanted to highlight the top three trees that were survivors. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree, I'm seeing people use it a lot and I'm really glad to see that. I think it's a great tree. I know the city of Denver is planting that all throughout the city. It's a great street tree as well as a shade tree. And then um, I'm gonna mention bur oak, but you can see along the line, there's a whole bunch of oak that really do well. So oak can be a very tough species for us and we can grow those um, just knowing that they can be quite large, they, they do well in a park setting. Um, and then this other one, Golden Rain Tree, I don't know if a lot of people are super familiar with this, but it's a beautiful tree. Um, it has a interesting uh, bloom that comes on in mid to late season, which is unique for a tree. But one thing you want to keep in mind when you are planting trees, just because here in the high plains and on the front range, they're not really native. Um, cottonwoods will grow along streams or creeks, but you don't see those naturally in the high plains and in grassy, um, grassy, you know, grasslands. So you, one thing you, again, I'm going to mention is plant small. I showed you the picture of the perennials planting small, but I would advise planting trees small as well. Again, bigger is not better. If you plant it small, it will get bigger faster. Um, also, you want to put trees on an irrigation line and maybe a separate irrigation line because throughout their life, they will need irrigation, especially when we get those warm winter days, we need to do winter watering. So it's nice to have those already planned for an irrigation. And then also the, the UV will cause, um, you know, some damage to the trunk. So it's important to wrap the young trees during the winter months to avoid sun scald. So just a couple of pictures of those trees. and. I don't know how many folks, uh, I mentioned the Plant Select uh, book being my Bible, so is Durr's Hardy 
woody landscape plants. Um, he, uh, if, if you look into, if you have this book and you should, um, you'll see his culture notes. And you can see right here that this is a perfect tree, chalk, drought, and city conditions. That's straight from Durr's mouth. And this is why this is such a great tree. By the way, it has really cool fall color. It's a nice yellow fall color and a nice um, cool bean, a little seed packet there. And then we've got uh, the, the oaks, which, I mean, I think we all know an oak and, and oaks are great just because they're strong wood. They're not weak wooded. They're not gonna break. They're good in a, a residential landscape. You know, if you're planting something that grows fast, it can be weak wooded and, and cause damage during our high winds and that sort of thing. So good residential plant. And then this is the golden rain tree, which we have at the gardens here, you can see, um, looking pretty fabulous. This is in the summer where it's blooming. Um, so this is the book that I love so much. Um, and this is my experience with maples thus far. I know that people want to plant these maples. Maples are a beautiful plant but they really almost all of the maples prefer moist bottomlands, wet, you know, moist soil, acidic soil, and they just can't tolerate pollution. So when we do put them in our landscape, and I understand that there will be a call and demand for that, we need to be really thoughtful about preparing that soil and making sure they're in a landscape where they'll be maintained by an owner or a residential um, folk, you know, setting where, Someone's going to really be caring for them, watering them, um, putting in iron in the soil, and that sort of thing. Planting this along a highway, any of these plants along a highway or in, in downtown, it's just going to be a recipe for, I think, failure because it's already just so stressful for these trees. So if you are going to plant a maple, I would plant this maple. Well, it's not a shade tree. It certainly is a beautiful maple that does extremely well in our our region. And this is a picture of um, the hot wings maple outside of the gardens and it, this has been growing for some time. So it is a little bit smaller than a uh, sugar maple say it's not going to be 60 feet or 50 feet. But you've got these beautiful um, samsaras that come on and that's what you can see here in the red. Um, that's the seed or the helicopters as we used to call them. And then in real nice fall color that you get as well. So this is this is the maple, the uh, that I would recommend. And the other plant that a lot of folks like to um, plant is the aspen. And that can be really tricky because they just, they're native to 6,500 in elevation or higher. So they're really gonna suffer from the, the heat that we get here. It's gonna be really tough. And I know a lot of clients will say, I just, I don't care, I want one. So if you're gonna try one, I would recommend Prairie Gold. Um, it has been tested out in Kansas and has had some success on the plains. So um, if you've got to go there, this might be a good option. And I think that's pretty much it, guys. Um, I, I just want you to think about, um, you know, a little summary about how different we are in climate in the West and how we're a totally different zone five. And especially if you're in an urban setting, you've got heat island and that sort of thing. But key takeaways is fix that soil up and take take a chance i'm telling you this works use squeegee stop adding so much organic and give this a try on a project and you'll see how successful it is and then of course know what plants to use um, i want to just once again remind you that uh, we are a, a regional program and we work with public private sector so i i hope that you guys will reach out to me if i can offer you any consulting on projects that you might need help with or if there's any questions you have, we'd be happy to help you with your project. So that's all I have. Here's my information. And I just want to thank everyone for their time and happy planting. Thanks.